Hey, welcome to the Pharmacy Residency Podcast, a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. This is part two, where I throw questions at Brandon Dyson that I've just made up, and I wrote a couple of them down, but uh, he's just going to answer off the cuff, and then he's going to explain why the answer is, and that's just like uh, the hundred questions that we went over in our book. Not only do we ask the question, answer the question, but we explain why they're asking it in the first place, so you can get a better idea of how you would answer uh, that question. Again, if you need help with your letter of intent, uh, go ahead to residencyhelp.com and uh, you can find my contact information there if you want to work one-on-one with me. But here's the episode. Welcome back to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. I'm so excited to have Brandon Dyson back to help us out. and We're going to have a back and forth as if I was Uh, the residency director or interviewer, and he'll be the interviewee, but he's not only going to just talk about the answers, he's going to give the rationale for them, Uh, and a number of these questions come from his book, but I've thrown him a couple curveballs, and I know you're going to enjoy this episode. But let's get into some questions, because I'm excited to see uh, how you tackle them, and so let's let's actually start with uh, uh, a softball. Well, call it a softball. Let's also preface. I, I have no idea which questions he's going to ask me, and I did not prepare answers, which you should prepare. <laughs> Let me also say that. So anyway, yeah, let's do this. Okay. Describe a time when you decided on your own that something needed to be done, and you took on the task to get it done. So this is all about – so what I'll do – when I when I answer these, if you're cool with that, Tony, I will kind of give you an example answer. Um, if I was a student, and then I'll kind of describe my thought process in that answer. Is that okay? Yeah, I checked the podcast manual. It's okay, so we're oh, good. Sweet. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> Do not want to violate the the podcast uh, rules, but um, <laughs> I was checking the podcast scroll. It's very old. Yeah. You know, hundreds podcast of years law old. is very. <laughs> you really don't want to run afoul of podcast law. Yeah. Um, okay, so, so a, a time when you decided. On your own. Now, before you answer the question, let's say I'm someone that's anxious, freaking out, um, borderline ADD as this person's asking the question. Is it appropriate to write the question down as they're asking it? You're probably not going to have a piece of paper like at this point for most of these interview questions because this might be happening literally while you're eating lunch. Maybe not this severe, but it it's not – inappropriate to write it down but it's not it's you probably won't need to probably what will be better is if you need to think of an answer you you, reflect you can you can reflect it you can be like so a time when i you know take a moment (laughs) like rephrase it a little Mm -hmm. you can also say hmm let me think about that for a moment do not spend four minutes (laughs) at that point that's just going to be weird but take a moment you know um and and think about it and again, most of these questions, you know, you're unless they're just trying to have fun with you, like I got asked, if you were a melon, what type of melon would you like? They're just trying to mess with you at that point in time. And then you're thinking, oh, gosh, was that yeah. a fruit, a vegetable, a melon? Yeah. Was that a melon? <laughs> what does it mean if I want to say cantaloupe? <laughs> <laughs> and they're sitting there doing that quiz online like. Uh, oh, this is a, is a he is a melon. He's a melon. Right. You know? And at that point they're they're seeing like questions like that. They're like, do you have a sense of humor? And like how do you roll with it, you know, if we mess with you a little? Like anyway, I haven't I've I've see I've used a great tactic of stalling in this question. You, you have asked. okay. So so oh. obviously not getting the thing done I'm asking you, which is just to answer the freaking first question. But All describe right. a time you decided on your own that something needed to be done and you took on the task to get it done. So I, this happened, um, at, I was, I was interning for Walgreens and I noticed that we had a lot, there was a big order that got put away. They were very busy, backed up. Um, and I, I was an intern and my technical job at this particular, at least on this shift, I was supposed to be manning the registers and doing flu shots. Um, but it just, you know, someone called out. And, you know, we were very backed up, very busy. The pharmacist was having a hard time keeping up with filling. And so I was able to go in 
and kind of very in between. And I never, I made sure to keep an eye on the register and with flu shots and everything. And I helped put away the order and helped fill meds. And I just, it was just really doing everything I could to kind of keep the flow going. Um, so I, that was Brandon's you know, sort of somewhat, you know, answer. So thought process going into that answer, um, would be, you want to, you want to showcase that you take initiative, you see something that needs to get done for whatever it is. It doesn't need to be for, you know, that didn't actually happen. Um, in my, in my Walgreens experience, I was completely made up on the spot, but the idea is like, are you self-motivated? Do you need to be told, do you need to have your boss or your manager be like, okay, go do this thing. You finish that thing. Great. Go do this thing. You want to, you want to write it. You want to come up with an answer that shows you just taking initiative that you're a self-motivated self-starter. And if you notice a thing, you know, whether that be, Hey, I didn't realize like on this oncology rotation, what our chop was. And so I went and looked up our chop and what kind of cancer it was treated for. Cause I saw in the medical note that the patient received three cycles of our chop. So far, you know, like you, did you go and look up what that was and what it was for versus like then ask in versus instead of asking me your preceptor, Hey, you got our chop. What's our chop, <laughs> right? Like it's looking for, do you take initiative basically? I don't take know if they have highlights still in the dentist's office, but there used to be a goofus and gallant and like <laughs> yeah. goofus would, would, you know, goofus sits and doesn't answer the door. Yeah. Gallant gets up and answers the door. And really if you can, instead of, you know, saying, Oh my gosh, I've got to come up with this really great scenario. All you have to do is just say, you know, I saw somebody had gum on their shoe. I told them they had gum on their shoe and I helped them throw it away. You know, it's like just, you, you it's just, it sounds like it's, it's common sense, but I, I can, I feel like the kind of A plus type student is going to try to make a huge deal out of something that's just, are you going to do things that you're supposed to do? A word of caution too is make sure that you don't, come across as standoffish, like, well, this other person wasn't doing their job and it felt like I needed oh. to get done. So I did it, you know, cause that really like that takes the shift of you being a self-motivated leader and you complaining and just throwing shade on other people. And that's no, you know, don't do that. <laughs> so be very careful how you phrase it. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to a, another question. I think that that format's going to work really well. Um, Let's uh, talk about a difficult work school situation when your workload was heavy uh, and how you handled it. So uh, let's say that um, in, your, in your CV you have a 16-hour-a-week um, job at the hospital uh, while you were a P3 uh, because you uh, had to support yourself uh, for the most part uh, to go through school. Um, and you weren't uh, given a tremendous amount of scholarship money. Uh, and so 16 hours a week is how much you had to work. Okay. So, I mean, this is an easy one for anyone in pharmacy school, especially <laughs> if you're working. So I was working. I had to do the, I had signed up for 16 hours a week. So that was, that was my whole weekend. I worked two eight hour shifts, um, or sometimes I would be off on Sunday and I would work two, four hour shifts in my evenings during the week. So eight and eight and it'd work a Saturday. Um, it, this happened a particular week where I had to work Tuesday and Thursday night from 4 PM to 8 PM. And I had exams on Wednesday and I had exams on Thursday. <laughs> so I had, I had exams both days. Um, these were really hard PT, um, exams, you know, really difficult subject matter. And so I've, you know, I have to study, but I've also made a commitment to the hospital. Um, not only do I need the money, but I made a commitment. I signed up to do it. No one, you know, and so what I had to do was really try to, you know, in the hospital, I, I work in a level one trauma center as an intern. So we're very, very busy. We're always stocking omni cells or, you know, that's what I was doing this particular week. Um, and it was just a particularly, it was a completely full patient load. Um, and so really, the way I had to prioritize it was I had to just be, I had what I, I mapped out my week basically. So I, I said, okay, here are my hours here. Here's the things that I need to get done. I need to study. You know, I estimated based off of what I've had in school so far, how long I need to study for a given exam. And then I blocked out responsibilities where I couldn't study. So I can't study a Tuesday to Thursday, four to eight. Those are out. Um, I can't study 
you know, this other time because I'm eating or I'm sleeping or whatever. And then the rest was fitting in times that I could study. You know, I was in class these times I can't study. But what I could do, I woke up a little bit earlier, nothing crazy, but I woke up at 5 a.m. and I studied for an hour or two before school. I studied for a little bit before bed. I had recorded my professor's lectures and I listened to them during my commute to try to absorb more. Um, I read tldrpharmacy.com because they had this great <laughs> no, had to. So your your answer, I guess here, you know, just is that you you can make priorities, right? You can prioritize what's most important. You might get if you you don't even have to balance work and school in this kind of a question. You can just say from work. Well, I was, you know, I, let's go back to what I just said for the last answer. I was an intern at Walgreens. There was a tote of things that needed to be put away. There was patients, you know, asking to pick up their prescriptions here. The drive through was ringing um, and I needed to go to the bathroom. Which order did I do those things in? Right. And like your answer needs to prioritize the patient first. 100%, right? So you get the guy at the counter, then the drive through. First, you tell the drive through guy to hold on, right? There's not necessarily a correct way to answer it, but it just shows that you prioritize what's most important and delegate. You know, if you're unable to finish your task, whatever it is at the hospital, for example, that you pass it on to the next shift or to, uh, you know, or to yourself tomorrow if, like, oh, I didn't study enough today. So can I study? I have to study extra time tomorrow. And it sounds That's like kind of what. Yeah. yeah, it sounds like you're you're talking. What you did that was a little surprising, and, and what impressed me was that you actually went backwards in time. So I feel like most people trying to answer that question would be at the problem and say, "Okay, well, there was a problem, and how did I deal with it?" Instead of saying, "Well, there was a problem, and I had that really tough time." But what I learned was that there was gaps in my planning. So the next time that actually didn't happen because I planned out my week. So I feel like you're going back in time was a really clever way to solve that, to say, I knew this was going to happen. Things don't happen to me uh, intentionally or things don't happen that way. Um, it's, it's, you know, so you're, you're giving them the impression like, okay, well, that might happen one time to you and it was bad, but it's not going to be as bad next time because you adjust to problems. Yeah, you learn from past experience, learn from mistakes. Okay. If you can showcase that with your answers, awesome. Okay. Well, let's talk pharmacy specific. Uh, so questions on pharmacy topics. Um, this is, uh, and, and I feel like <laughs> you could go with the, well, I wasn't really sure about the job market, so residency is my backup. So I'm really kind of <laughs> hoping that you take me because I really didn't plan on not getting accepted. So I'm really hoping this works out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I think that, you know, in terms of, uh, I'll, I'll just ask the question, but in terms of just kind of broad picking up what's going on in pharmacy, where do you recommend someone pick up or keep up with pharmacy? You know, you can read that, okay, Amazon's coming, Amazon's not coming. Um, you know, do you have to be up on the Affordable Care Act? You know, did you, you know, did you read the thousand pages? You know, how up on what's going on in pharmacy do you need to be before you can even answer a question like that? I think if if you just are up enough on the headlines so that you can have a reasonably intelligent conversation, you do not have to be like, oh, yeah, well, Amazon's got this 12-point strategy for, you know, basically <laughs> entering into the, the, you know, like, or your, your answer could be bow down before the Amazon <laughs> ship and just accept that they will employ us all soon. But Right. Or, uh, or Alexa will be giving... Alex is like, I've been answering your questions long enough. It's your turn. <laughs> you know? So a question like that about like, where do you see the field of pharmacy going or whatever? You know, like, yeah. saying. like it's, it's really designed. Like, are you interested in the profession? Like it's, that's really what it is. It's not like testing you, of your current event knowledge, or you're a student, you're studying a trillion hours a week, right? It's just, are you in, because if you're interested, you'll, you'll just, you'll pick up on stuff like this, you know, and it's just, it's a casual question, honestly, like kind of looking at, do you, do you pay outside, pay attention to that bubble outside of what you need to know as a student for the next exam, you know, and kind of look at the trends for the profession as a whole. Okay. And then are you thoughtful about it? You know, how do you insert yourself and how do you plan, you know, is residency a part of your strategy for that? Or what's, what's your end game, you know? Okay. Well, this one, this next one's going to be a trap. 
I, I, didn't, <laughs> I, I, I just read the first line and, and I, I know exactly, exactly how you can go wrong on this one. So what was your favorite Ippy Appy rotation and why? What was your least favorite Ippy and Appy rotation and why? This this has trap written all over it. Yeah, you have walked directly. Okay. So my favorite Ippy rotation was infectious disease um, for a few reasons. A, a large part of it, I absolutely love the preceptor. She was fantastic. Um, she was very, you know, gave me autonomy while at the same time providing, you know, exact like perfect real world instruction she was very she let me do a lot she let me interview patients she let me interview physicians and round with the team um and i just i felt like i i really grew a lot and in, in an area that really interested me um and i learned you know what kind of like if i were to ever be a teacher or a preceptor i would want to be like her and i really really grew to love the area of infectious disease my least favorite um rotation was I had a trans I had a rotation with the transplant team. Um a solid organ transplant, very, very busy, and it just it what I I guess what I disliked like the area has never particularly interested me. That was part of it. Um the team was very large. There were three nurse practitioners. There was literally a half a dozen <laughs> residents plus an attending. Um, you know, there, there was, there was my priest, there was two pharmacy preceptors that were there on it. Like, so it was this giant team walking around the SICU and then walking around the medicine unit afterwards, seeing patients. Um, and, you know, honestly though, I think where, why it was, you know, I would have done a lot differently with that rotation. So it was my least favorite, but I think on I didn't step up enough. Um, I felt very timid as a student. I had no idea even what tacrolimus is, tacrolimus is, they, uh, you know, and how to adjust a dose for someone that's two months post transplant. You know, that has now come in with CMV infection. You know, like I had no idea what to do um, with the multitude. Now they've got tuberculosis and they started ripe therapy. You know, I and honestly, I I felt like I didn't ask enough questions. I was too timid and I was so focused on. Hey, these, this is a transplant patient that I would forget entirely that I knew how to manage their blood sugar that was too high, and I knew I, you know, their their blood pressure that was too high. So I would have liked. I really, it was my least favorite rotation for the challenge, but I also learned a lot about how I can approach other rotations in it. Um, so what I'm going for there, <laughs> the trap that you want to avoid is your least favorite, obviously, where you just talk nothing but smack about this preceptor <laughs> that you had and this team that you had. Even if you feel like it's warranted, it doesn't matter. Now is not the time, <laughs> you know, you're Pharmacy is small. There's a chance that yeah. the person that you slam is like, oh, yeah, I know them. We're buddies. We hang out at ASHP when we meet up yeah. together. Uh, when we, just, we graduated <laughs> together, you know? Yeah. So you, you just – you want to be careful with that. Um, really – you're you're taking a negative experience with your least favorite. You want to turn that as much into a positive as possible. What did you learn from it? So just kind of like that last question. You had this terrible experience. Cool. Why was it terrible? And more importantly, like what did you get out of it? What and you not, you know. Well, I guess what I was impressed with is that what you didn't do was say, Well, I didn't really have any ones that I didn't like. Yeah. Can you do that? Can you, can you, can you pull that one or are they, because I, I feel like the, the way that, you know, we, when, when I was around residency, I, we all got along really well. And I feel like if all of us were there watching you, we'd be sitting there with our thumbs going down, like, boo, boo, yeah. you know, you, boo. Popcorn, tomatoes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, I don't like doing it. I don't, I'm, I'm not a fan of it. Um, if you do it have a good reason why and and still talk about uh, you know i you can or or hedge hedge if you need to say like, oh i really liked all of them i guess a challenge you know one that i found particularly challenging and that i think i grew a lot from and it was really difficult in the time which was very stressful you can like kind of soften it or hedge it that way if you feel like you have to like you have to get some lesson. It's a complete and total cop out to be like, well, oh, I don't have any. <laughs> Next <Okay>. question. <laughs> but but I can see how someone might not. I just talked to Tola Adabanjo uh, from UMES, and 
she had uh, the Hopkins residency training one. She had APHA. And then she was at the VA near her home where she could spend time with her family. So there was these oh, three yeah. great rotations that are warm hugs. And, you know, to say least favorite, it would it would have to be, well, this was maybe the least favorite part of a, right. one of the rotations. But, but yeah, never to say no, no. Now, did I, I, I did ask you two questions in pharmacy. So let's see about your professional growth. <laughs> um, so how would you categorize a PGY-1 residency as another learning experience or as the beginnings of a career path or job and why? So both um honestly both i see it as both you know it's been kind of said to me throughout school that a residency is equivalent of about three years of clinical experience um i've talked to plenty of my peers who've gone through residencies and have an idea of what to expect and i know it's a very very challenging year but that there's a lot of growth there's a lot of learning involved there's you know, is accelerated a, a growth year as I think you can have in the field of pharmacy. So it's absolutely a learning experience. But at the same time, I'm a licensed pharmacist in a residency and I'm, you know, there's a staffing component to this residency. I'm, I'm the pharmacist making the call on if this treatment's appropriate or not. And, you know, I'm going on rounds with the team and, you know, maybe the first day or first couple of days of a new rotation or even the first week early on, my preceptor may round with me, but they're going to stop rounding with me based off what I've heard from my friends that have gone through residency anyway. And it's it's on me to be the pharmacist for the team at that point in time. So it it really is the beginnings of a career path. And me personally, I want to I want to kind of transition this into a PGY2 um, and infectious disease. And so this is, this is, you know, a necessary step for that. I can't get a PGY2 without a PGY1, obviously. So I, I really see this as both. Now you didn't um, do a PGY2, but go ahead and explain your answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I did not. So again, I, I, I'm making these up on the spot. So I'm just explaining what I'm saying with this is one, yes, your residency is absolutely a learning year, but I think the meat behind this question is, are you ready to take the jump from student to pharmacist? And and I, I'm just speaking completely plainly, it took me almost my entire PGY-1 to really get that. Like I should probably, that was like the, you know, my hero struggle throughout my PGY-1 <laughs> was, is Brandon really finally ready to be a big boy now, you know? <laughs> The hero's journey, for those of you that don't know, is uh, it's it's what Luke Skywalker did, basically. Something <laughs> tragic happens. Uh, he meets conflict. He goes on a journey. Uh, he learns something from it. Um, I don't know if meeting your father is part of it, but yeah. uh, but there's there's a there's a path to the hero's journey and uh, it involves that that conflict and uh, so forth. But um, did you have anything else to add yeah. after that? No, that that's primarily it. Just see a question like this. Make sure that you understand that even though our residency is a learning experience, it's a job. You're interviewing for an actual job. You will be receiving an actual paycheck. They are hiring you to do X, Y, and Z, and you are absolutely going to be a licensed pharmacist as contingent on your residency. So you do have to see it as the beginning of a career path as well. I think in the book, I probably say something like I answer this with yes and yes, I think is my like, let me cheat and look. Yeah, I did. So I said, <laughs> like to answer this with yes and yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah. OK, well, let's uh, let's ask a, a softball question that actually can be incredibly difficult. Um, so you told us you're not interested in a PGY2. Uh, what's your one year goal then where you come in in July, you leave in July? or you leave at the end of June, uh, where do you see yourself? My idea with this, with the PG, with my one year goal. So I don't want to do a PGY two. Um, at what? this point, we all did PGY twos. Yeah, no. So, I mean, and, and maybe I'll, ch I'm open to it. I'm open to changing my mind. I want to, what I want to set myself up for is, is flexibility more than anything. I want to, to me, if I learn the skills, what what I will get out of one year of residency training is, you know, I'm going to go on an ID rotation. I'm going to go on a transplant on an oncology rotation. I'm going to have a practice management rotation. I'm going to be inserted in 
and it'd be expected to perform at the pharmacist at a high level for all of these things. And what I'm, I think I'm really going to get out of that is the ability to pick up basically anything so that if I, if my career takes me into such a path that an oncology specialist position opens up, even if I haven't done a PGY2 or maybe not a specialist, but a position in oncology or a position in transplant, or maybe my family decides they have to move. Um, and you know, I, I have the skills necessary to transition what I've learned to learn as a pharmacist, to learn on the job, to contribute and to be a team player and to, to get, to, to help contribute where, you know, anywhere that my career takes me, it gives me the flexibility to apply my skills and, and be a, a valued pharmacist to actually add value to the, wherever I'm working. That's what I want to get out of one year out of this. Awesome. Um, Okay. Well, let's, Let's transition to the last section, which is personality related questions. And I'm going to adjust it a little bit just to kind of make it a little bit more of a, of a softball or maybe a, just make it a little more authentic. But um, so I'm a marathoner, uh, even though I'm a resident right now, I'm still uh, getting my runs in. Uh, I get a long two hour run or three hour run there on Sunday. Um, what is it that you like to do outside of the pharmacy? Uh, what do you do for fun? So I, a few things, um, I am very active in a church group. Um, and so we do a lot of youth mentoring where, you know, obviously every Sunday, but we, we do stuff throughout the week week as well. Um, we'll have, you know, it's with a youth group of their primarily between 12 and 14 years old, 12 and 15. Um, and we'll, we'll, I mean, anything you will, we'll go to the local basketball court, you know, we'll organize a basketball game or we'll have, you know, a, a punch party or something, you know, so we do things like that. Um, I'm also a pretty avid guitar player. I played guitar since I was 13. I've, I don't play in a band specifically right now, but I played in bands all through high school. Um, yeah, I, I'll play an, an odd wedding or so for a friend here or there. So I, I really enjoy playing guitar, blues, rock, country, really anything. I, I just, I, I love the instrument and the flexibility and the voice of it. So I like to spend a lot of free time there. And that's sort of my, my wind down is, you know, a little few minutes on a guitar can really just kind of reset my calm, you know, at the end of the night. Yeah. Churchill used to paint, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, he's dealing yeah. with world war two and, and he's off painting and people are like, painting and and just you know if you have that kind of stress you really do need a place where you do something completely different and don't underestimate the opportunity to connect with someone there that has that same thing and you know for the eight hours you have someone else might remember oh yeah that was the runner oh yeah that was the one with it and and they're really trying to make it so that they can remember you and the one thing besides some kind of mistake maybe you made or you know oh catch up on the collar whatever it is but this is the one time that if you are authentic, uh, that you're probably going to find someone else that, that has something similar and they're, they're going to remember you because of it. Uh, so I, let, let's go completely vague on the final question here. Um, list some personal attributes that you would like to improve and what have you done to improve them? So what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> I am flawless. <laughs> So don't use that answer. Oh, that's a flaw. Um, Isn't that what Socrates yeah. said? Or... <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> Philosophical. <than I. laughs> so a few things. Um, I it, it's, it's a blessing and a curse. I see things from a 10,000 foot view. Um, you know, and I always have, I see the big picture. I, I see how it, how it all works together and how it all fits and and that is a wonderful thing for many, you know, for studying for pharmacy school. That's what's got me here to this interview. It's it's done a lot of great things for me. At the same time, you when you see from ten thousand feet, you sometimes miss a really important detail. And so while I won't, I don't necessarily get mired down in details all the time and get overwhelmed with, you know, I, I can see where the system has to move and I know how to prioritize. I might miss that. You know, I, I, this happened a couple of times on a pharmacy test where I missed, you know, which of the following is not indicated or something, you know, I missed Circle that Circle the knot, word. underline the knot. <laughs> yeah, I missed that all important word and, you know, it's the devil is in the details. So what I do, and it's just, just like you said, um, I, I take that pause, you know, I, I pause for a minute. I briefly review before doing, you know, before I answer the test question. 
I do, you know, and, and I make sure, okay, here's what it says. There is no polarity word that changes it from not to, or accept or anything. And then I answer. And so, and, and the really, I, the, the way I do it, I had to physically train myself to take a breath before either circling the Scantron or some of our tests are on a computer now before I hit the submit button. I literally take a breath. It takes one second and it's, that's my reset to make sure I don't just go down some memorized neuro pathway and just click, click the button or, or circle the, the dot. Okay. So we've gone through your document. The one thing I wanted to talk about, uh, and then this is going to also segue into probably what our next conversation is going to be. And I may even chop this one in half because we've gone over an hour and I'll probably release oh, wow. them both. On the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll release them both in the same day, not to be like, okay, well let's get, you know, downloads on this day and this day. Uh, but just so that I feel like they'll listen to the first part of it one time and then the second part, uh, more than one time. But this is the question that, uh, although when I read that document and we talked about it, they said that the college of pharmacy you went to is very irrelevant. Um, you know, they're picking you on other um, issues. So uh, where you are on U.S. News and World Report is, is quite irrelevant. However, uh, NAPLEX scores have gone down quite a bit. And I didn't realize this until just a couple of days ago. I'd never actually bothered to look at it. But the and I've got the acronym right now. MPJE, the multi-state pharmacy jurisprudence exam, scores are all over the place. And I feel like because residencies are all over the place, when going from one state to another, it's harder to unlearn something than it necessarily was, would have been just to learn it if you'd never been, you know, tainted with your, your <laughs> home state. <laughs> so... Nice. How do you instill confidence in this group? Because I think they're going to use the PICOA soon, that uh, pharmacy curricular outcomes assessment uh, to give a score to you as you're going through school. And that'll happen in the next couple of years, maybe. But how can you give them confidence? Um, let's say your college has an 80, 85 percent pass rate on the NAPLEX, which is about average. Uh, how can you give them confidence that, you know, 45 days in, you're not going to have a bad conversation like, well, they let me take it again in another month and a half. So if you guys don't mind staffing and covering me now, that'd be cool. You know, how can we, how can we better ourselves for the NAPLEX and MPJE? I, you know, what I recommend is take them as early as you can in the year. Like, and, and that's setting yourself up during your fourth year because, you know, for and a lot of states you have to get a fingerprint, you know, and the board of pharmacy only meets once a month or whatever. Like the, and it, it, it just takes sometimes 45, 60 days to schedule a test. Like I, the earliest I could have taken the NAPLEX, I think was June or July, I think July. Um, and, and so just making sure all of your ducks in a row and the first month of residency, you're not on a hard, most of the time you're, you're doing like an orientation where you learn the computer system and, you know, kind of the workflow and everything. So you, you, if you can ever afford to like really crunch study for the NAPLEX or the, and the MPH, MPJE, now is the time to do it. I really, really encourage you trying to get it done as early as possible. Um, otherwise it's, you know, depending on where you go, the first, first few rotations, it, it's going to be a challenge and it you're, I don't, I don't know. I don't have a great answer. And I mean, you just will have to find a way to fit it in your, you know, I use tools, RX prep, you know, for MBJE, uh, TLDR has a, a nice little cheat sheet that we've made to help streamline your MPJE studying that you kind of fill out. We don't need to go into detail with it now, but use the tools that you have that might save you time. Um, and, and really try to take it early and prepare, you know, you're going to have, you graduate in May, early May, and you don't start residency into July. Use that time. I know you're tired, you know, yeah. and I, I know you want to rest up for residency, but study, get as much done while you have the time to do it because it's only going to get worse and right future you will thank you to prepare now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I've, I've talked to, uh, I guess the, the take home I wanted to, um, take from that and we'll, we'll talk about, uh, the MPJE in a, in a different podcast episode, but I've heard people blow it off as, you know, kind of irrelevant. It's just the law. It'll be fine. And 
the failures that I hear are not by a lot of points. You still lose a game by one point. Yeah. You still fail the MPJE by one point. I passed it by one point. Uh, so I, I never hear anybody going, oh, I crushed it. Uh, I was I, emailed today by someone by someone that failed it twice by one point. And he had a 74 both times. Oh, my gosh. I just and I'm can't. like – <laughs> yeah, it, it breaks my heart. That's the email I got today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we'll talk about that another another time. All right, well, Brandon, thanks for, for being on the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast, and uh, we'll definitely uh, have you back for the um, MPJE uh, as people are studying for that. All right, thanks, Don. Hey, what up? This is Brandon Dyson from tldrpharmacy.com. Why am I interrupting you in the middle of this excellent podcast? Because as soon as you're finished with it, I want you to come to my website, Obviously, at tldrpharmacy.com, you'll find a whole boatload of free clinical guides and cheat sheets. They'll save you hours of time, and they'll make learning pharmacy easy. And also, well, our guides are fun. Whether you're a student or a practicing pharmacist, you'll enjoy reading them. I promise. Check out tldrpharmacy.com and get better at pharmacy.